Welcome into Inside the Archives, XRT's latest podcast. I'm your host, Marty Rosenbaum, XRT's digital content producer and all things social media. We are back after a couple week break. Our last episode I recorded with Marty Leonard is dissecting the Lollapalooza lineup, which is now over four weeks old. And I apologize for the break. It wasn't for a lack of good ideas, but unfortunately I succumbed to the virus that was going around Chicago that everyone seemed to catch. And had we recorded this episode, which I've had in my back pocket for a while right now, and I'm really excited about, I would have sounded terrible and you would have been annoyed probably within the first 30 seconds of listening to me if you aren't so already. But needless to say, we're back at it, back at full health, and I'm really excited about this episode where we will be joined by XRT's engineer, and one of the main forces behind XRT's intimate Blue Cross Blue Shield performance stage, Dominic Mendocino. If you've been to XRT's performance stage, you've seen how cool of a room it is. Or if you've watched webcast, you've seen what types of artists that we have coming by. I mean, we've had hundreds of artists stop by this intimate stage for exclusive performances. And it gives the lucky fans that gain attendance to these shows the opportunity to catch their favorite musicians or emerging artists up close and personal. So as we get set to celebrate the fifth anniversary of the Blue Cross Blue Shield performance stage this summer, I wanted to pick Dom's brain on how these shows get put together, how a rock show gets made, as well as defy and confirm some engineer stereotypes. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome XRT's engineer, Dom Mendocino. Dom, how's it going? It's good. I will definitely take some blame on why this episode has not been recorded uh, for a couple weeks. I've been hard to come by, I think, with random engineering things i don't know yeah well it's a busy stage we got so i think you know if we have an artist that may take a little bit higher priority than recording this podcast but we're here we're here right now and let's talk some music and some engineering so you've been with the company for a while now and basically was one of we're one of the main forces that helped build the stage how, how did this whole idea of a performance stage come together well when i started at xrt the room didn't exist yet um, I got hired to do remote broadcast, and when I had gotten hired, I had just gotten off the road uh, mixing monitors for an artist. I had worked in recording studios, built some other venues around Chicago, and, and you know, it was all freelance. So I got hired here, and I heard the talk of this room, a performance stage, kind of a mini venue inside of the building of the uh, radio stations. It was Sam Kappas' idea to, to build a stage inside of the building where the radio stations exist. So he was walking by one day, and Lady Antebellum is playing in a conference room. He sees him, and he didn't think anything of it. But a few weeks later, he goes and watches the Grammys, and all of a sudden, they're winning a Grammy. And he's like, they were just in the conference room. And he thought how sad it was to have a Grammy-winning artist in a conference room right so it was ultimately his idea and the timing of me getting hired just worked out so basically when i heard the room was going to be constructed my mouth started watering and i basically said here's my background i would love to be a part of this room right if you haven't been to the blue cross blue shield performance stage yet and you've seen the webcast it looks like a rock and roll venue i mean something that you would find you know, in a, in a, in a bar in Chicago, it's, it's a legitimate looking and sounding venue. But if you've been to the Prudential building, which is where all of intercom stations are located, it's right in the middle of office space. You, you, you walk up the floor and you have no idea that this room even exists until you walk down the hall and you take a peek in and you say, you know, you look at it and it's a whole venue. So as, as the room was starting to get turned from concept into reality, you know, take us through the steps what were some of the challenges that you faced in turning what was office space into a music venue like you said it's in an office building so to get anybody's head around what this was going to look or feel like was a challenge um we're walking around the room right now right so those of you at home can't see but it's a small room you know it holds legally 85 people so it's a small room that packs a lot of punch what we wanted to do was create a room that was the the buzzword was legitimacy and authenticity. We wanted people to walk in and immediately know that they could feel comfortable that we were going to handle their live performance well and we were going to get their message across to the web and who was 
in, live in the room. We wanted from, them from the artists, right? Correct. Yeah. Right. So we wanted the artists to feel comfortable once they walk through these doors and be like, "Oh, they got it. This is all good. We're not worried at this radio station." Typically, radio station performances were in conference rooms, right, with no PA at a conference table or in a people are eating a sandwich in the back of the room <laughs> watching them a rock star play. Yeah, that was I was gonna say before this room was built, that was pretty commonplace and part of the allure for me of getting into radio was just being on the receiving end of those because you would have artists come in and almost play a concert to you right at your desk and maybe two, three, four other people that were by. There was never they were nearby. It was never, hey, let's bring the public in to our conference room and, you know, bring them into these intimate settings. It was really just We've got an artist, they're going to play a couple songs for you. And that whole spectacle of someone like a Dan Auerbach or a Chris Cornell coming into your office and playing music for you, to me, is hilarious. Yeah. If you're a fan of any artist, whatever your favorite artist is, and you see that artist in a room of 85 people, I mean, you could virtually reach out and touch this artist playing. Right. That's how close you are. It is, to some listeners, literally the best moment in their life. And we take it for granted because we're here every day. I do. I know that. But there are times when you get slapped in the face with, wow, this is absolutely amazing to have a Dan Auerbach or a Chris Cornell on the stage. These people who hear these shows, they are in for some of the best. I mean, people still talk about it. People I've invited who are friends of mine still talk about shows that they've seen in this room. Yeah. And it's... uh. You know, so getting back to the logistics of the room, I mean, how, how, how big is, of a space is it? Do you know off the top of your head? I don't know square footage, but again, capacity is 85 people. So if you've ever seen a room, you know that capacity is way lower than what it looks like the room can exactly. hold. Exactly, exactly. And just for your visual reference as you're listening, we currently have laid out uh, two sections, one section with four rows of chairs, one section with five rows of chairs, uh, and only a couple chairs per row. So you are literally getting up close and personal. Those that are in the first row right here are five feet from the stage. There's no bad seat in the house. So from a visual perspective, it's great. It's a pretty much a square room. You get a direct view of the artist. What were some of the challenges that came with making sure the room sounded good? Well, that's always a challenge in any room. So it's just it it just was different than a bigger room. You have a small room, compact space. It's all hard surfaces. So, you know, you have a hard floor, hard walls. You want it to sound good. You don't want it to blow the audience out of the water either. So it's a balance. You know, we have a legitimate PA with subs and flown main speakers, just like a venue would have. Um, it's really all about control in the back and control on stage to, to managing expectations of artists as well as audience, as well as listeners on the radio or the web. Right. So as we're looking at the equipment here, this is a lot of the equipment that you'll find at any rock club throughout the city. Correct. A lot of clubs in Chicago have the same mains and subs we have. Um, a lot of the lighting, our lighting package is pretty good intense there's a lot of lights in here to create a really cool effect and atmosphere for the artists um and the crowd you know the monitoring on the stage the artists feel like it's an actual venue right without the smell of beer and whiskey permeating <laughs> through the room for some that's probably a good thing for some that probably gets relegated to the green room. sometimes i wish we could have <laughs> beer and whiskey in the room yeah well like we said that is one of the downsides of being within an office complex is you can't truly recreate the rock and roll setting. But all jokes aside, you can tell when artists come here that they're blown away by it, too. I mean, I think as an artist goes through and stops by radio stations, nowadays these types of venues may be commonplace. But when this first opened in 2013, it broke ground as far as radio station venues go. Yeah. So let me take you through when I was on the road watching an artist go to these same events. So you'd be touring every day you have a show. Maybe you have one day off here, one day off there. But every night you have a show, every day you have a radio event. So you go to these radio stations. You drive the bus to the radio station. Artist is extremely tired. We're all tired. You go up to the radio station, kind of lollygag in. You know, you, you do your best to, to have a great performance, and then you leave. When you come here, it's different. They have that same potentially mentality of oh we're going to a radio station we know what the radio gig is going to be we know how to handle these this is what it is so i'll meet the artists down on the ground level i'll bring them up the freight elevators with gear if they have it if not we have a lot of backline here they walk through the door and they immediately see a stage fully patched microphones um 
amplifiers that they already need if they're not bringing them up we have amplifiers on the stage um we have everything an artist could need and could want aside from their specifics you know artists will always bring guitars artists will always bring cymbals and snare but they use a lot of our backline we have a full drum kit we have amplifiers again we have you know nord stage 2 which is a pretty standard touring keyboard so as far as breaking ground with this room we did because no other place really had this. It's not just the four walls around it. It's the technology and the assets we have within the room. Like I said, the amplifiers, we have real amplifiers, an Ampeg SVT, Fender Deluxe, you know, stuff you see touring bands use on the road and on big stages. So we've kind of set a standard of what the optimal performance stage should be. Right, and for those that may not be as technically inclined, I certainly am not like that as well. Uh, a lot of the amps that you see here, these are the same ones that you're going to see up on stage when they play, let's say, like a Vic Theater, the Riviera, the Aragon, uh, Chicago Theater, all these larger scale venues. These amps wouldn't look out of place up there. No, they wouldn't look out of place on these big stages because coming somewhat from that world and recording studios and, you know, knowing a lot of people in that business, we have a lot of the same exact equipment that you would see on those big stages. Right. Artists will always send out in advance. They will always tell me what they would prefer. As far as equipment goes. As far as equipment goes, um, as far as microphone choice goes, they'll always send me their specifics. A lot of times we already have what they've specified on that list. We don't have to worry about anything because that's the kind of gear we have here. It's all pro, you know, all well-maintained and artists use it constantly. Right, so that's gotta help an artist when they come in here and see familiar equipment, even if they, you know, I'm sure you have artists that may be more uh, inclined as far as gear goes. You have gear nerds, but people that are just using old reliables, equipment that they've had their entire life and are leaving it up to their engineers to figure out how to make it sound good. Either end of the spectrum, an artist falls on or an engineer that an artist brings with, that's got to be something they notice when they walk in the room and are delighted by right away. Was that something you guys you know, help plan out at the onset of this stage? Or did you want to bring that on gradually and go through trial and error as the stage was getting built? Well, we did plan on that from the very get-go. Hands down, we, that's exactly the goal of this room. Um, whenever you build something or bring something to the table, you know, you only have as many resources as you have or as much resources as you have, so we had to start somewhere. Right. We did not have all the gear on this stage that we have now when we started, but we did grow our stockpile up as the years went on, as we saw what artists use, what they prefer, a little bit of trial and error. We kind of always had an end goal in mind. I don't think we'll ever be there, just the nature of being us. We always want to get more and, and get get better gear or, or more gear that's always used, but we've come to a place where we cover a lot of the spectrum of bands that come in. Yeah, and how much does seeing what an artist bring in influence the decision you guys make to get a new piece of gear? That's an interesting question because it depends. You have to take that with a grain of salt too because an artist has their own you know, personal biases, just like you with music, just like me with music, or any of that. It's all subjective. So you cannot go and get, oh, he's got that year fender strat or or a guitar like that because chances are nobody else is going to want that anyway right with drums same way i'm a guitar player drums are very personal you know there's so many variations of drums whether it's cymbals or snare drum or the wood on the tom drums or even the size so that we kind of have a stock kit um, that most like to use. Some don't. Some prefer their own. You may have their logo on it or, or whatnot, but we look at what they brought in, but we also take that with a grain of salt simply because uh, taste is up to the individual. So we'll look at it. We'll kind of say, okay, you know what? Maybe the, you know, the 8x10 Ampeg will work because 90% of people want that amp here anyways. Right. Now, we did have that amp at the very beginning of this room because we already knew that. And the other thing is artists can always bring their own gear in. Artists can always bring their own amps in if they needed to. If we didn't have this, you know, it would be more of a pain for an artist to come in and, you know, do a full band set because they would have to bring their own drums and, and amps and all of that. But aside from all of that, the technical 
capabilities of this room and how much it actually is like a big stage or what they're used to is really probably the secret sauce of it all is that they come up here and what they request on their tour we can pretty much handle as far as the audio requirements of this room are right and we've seen that firsthand with some artists like i recall trombone shorty coming uh several months ago and he had his entire band on the stage there were eight musicians up there uh we've had bands do full band electric performances we've had people come in with just an acoustic guitar we've had dj setups so it's really a diverse space as far as performances go artists can decide how they want to perform if it wants to be a stripped down acoustic set we can do that if it wants to be a full band performance like they're doing later on that evening they're certainly capable of doing that if they want to do a hybrid you're able to do that as well so from your end as an engineer when you see an artist give you their plans ahead of time they're saying hey dom we want to bring in our full band setup you know as opposed to an artist that says hey dom we're going to have one acoustic guitar how does your approach to putting a show like that together change based off of what they provide well the first thing that will change when they ask for a bigger setup is we need more time right so if a band comes in and they want an acoustic guitar and one vocal sound check we could get away with you know 30 minutes before doors i'll have everything ready to go prior to them coming and we do a couple you know verse courses i'll have them sing a little bit and i'll mix it and it's very very efficient and quick um with a full band the approach is we need more time and i need to know exactly what they want so i can have everything prepped prior to their arrival that's the key because that allows us to efficiently sound check a band in an office building. I cannot tell you how many times bands wanted to come in early and sometimes we let them, but the sound checks pissed off everybody <laughs> two floors down. Yeah, and as a reminder, we're in the middle of an office space. So right on the other sides of these walls, there's cubicles and offices with people working. So it is a delicate balance. It's not even just our own people because they we just tell them just to cool it and, and deal with it. <laughs> it's about two and three floors down right that if we have a kick drum going and sound check for 30 minutes literally getting tones on the kick drum people are going to get pissed we we had a band that will i will continue with unnamed that played so loud in this room i just want to put it out there i was on vacation i was not here for this one that the building that butts up against ours complained wow a floor in the next door building wow technically complained because of how loud it was it's rock and roll man I, and hey if i could blow the windows out of this place i would <laughs> it may have an expensive cleanup fee but that does go to show the power of the room so you know as, as you're talking about getting the room set up for a show and the finer points that go into putting a live show together let's just take a quick walk through for your average concert goer who may know nothing about engineering all they do is purchase a ticket to the show get there at showtime watch the show what are, what are a few things you can share with us that go into making that show a reality that most people might not be aware of? Prior to you ever getting in line to go through the front door of those venues, hours before you were there, the venue, personnel, the artist, the artist personnel, whether it be their production manager, tour manager, everybody is already on site working you know, from the morning on, whether whatever your load in time is, that's what time you get to the venue. So that's what time you load in all your gear. Right. We're already working before you've ever even arrived because we need to make sure all the technicals are all good. It sounds good. Everything works. You know, you have time to adjust. So artists will come to the venue. We will set up our stage, load in their gear, all of that. Um, artists will kind of get settled in the green room do their thing, hang out while engineers get all the technicals okay as far as uh, where you plug your mics in, what amps are we going to use, uh, mic channels. Um, and and after that's all done and, and we check every line, it's called a line check, um, we get the band out to sound check. Um, depending on the band, they'll do a couple songs. Um, they'll get the feel of the stage during that time. And we'll get a good mix and, and get some good settings for the venue for the certain scenario that we're in. That's all prior to even you showing up to the venue. Right. You know, sound checks end before anybody gets inside. So once that's over, 
artist goes in the green room. We kind of hang back by front of house, play house music, and that's typically when you'll get let into the doors here. Right. So once the doors open for a show, everything has to be wrapped up. Correct. So it, it's a lot of work that goes into it, and you see that getting replicated on our stage uh, when artists come in. You go through the exact same procedures. So no matter how big, how small of a stage, this is the process that they're going through. I have to imagine, as you mentioned, you've been on a tour before as an engineer. That's got to be difficult having to repeat that process day in and day out, all while you're in unfamiliar surroundings. So on a personal level, is being in the stage bringing you some satisfaction that you don't have to get on a bus and then recreate a whole new room every single day? Yes. It's great because I get to go home every night. And on a tour, you don't get to do that. You go and sleep on a bus or in a hotel. What benefit engineers get as far as the technical reasons on a tour is they are seeing the same set every night. They are using pretty much the same console every night, too, if you travel with your own console. Although you are going to different venues and you have to adjust to the venue, what the space is like, how it sounds in the room, you're getting a rhythm. Right. And you have you know a lot of the same channels and settings, and you get in a rhythm. Now, getting in a rhythm is good and bad. Getting in a rhythm could mean you're getting bored, too. Here, every week, we'll have, like you mentioned before, we'll have Chris Cornell come in. Or we'll have white denim come in. And then the next week, you know, Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings come in and there's 12 members on the stage and you got to, or however many that were, you know. Right. Uh, that's where it's fun in here because it is always changing and it is just constant um, adjustment. And, you know, for me, I love it because it keeps my chops up. Right. <laughs> Working with artists, different artists, uh, uh, different size bands. Sometimes, you know, different engineers. In fact, there are some people in here that I've been on the road with and I reconnected in this room. Yeah. So that, I mean, that leads me to my next question. Then it builds that familiarity doing shows over and over, whether you're on the road or you're in the stage here, uh, just in terms of your equipment, is it fair to say if you're a concert goer and you're going to the very first show of a tour and a band plays a pretty similar set list every night that the sh and let's say this band returns at the end of the tour, plays the same city here in Chicago, plays a similar set list are you going to hear two different shows as a concert goer just because like you said you build that familiarity you know what's working what's not working as it gets road tested i feel like that's a loaded question Be well it's a it's a interesting question because that's a lot of variables involved okay you have a band with people right everyone's a person no matter what star you put on a pedestal everybody's a human being so people have their good days and their bad days people get tired and people are enthused and energetic which say the first day of a tour say you're touring a record for the first time you might be jacked your first show everyone's just has butterflies potentially everyone's excited um this is not everybody this is just you know uh uh what could happen so your band you're touring your record for the first time new record and you're excited you got you know butterflies you're you're excited to go show the crowd and on though you're doing that on the last day of your tour maybe you're out three months maybe you're just tired so you can get two different shows both ways you know see that's a hard question to answer i'm trying to answer that because that's why i'm asking the hard questions I know. i'm here you've been, you've been on the road with these people but it is uh I, th I think it is something that could get lost on concert goers as you keep going to shows you do have this expectation that's built up and rightfully so these artists are incredibly talented individuals that put forth amazing works of art but from the perspective of putting together a show the day-to-day -day variances that come with it do can can cause a lot of unforeseen circumstances you know again everyone's human no, you know if you are going to see your favorite band the day after the lead singer dog dies it's going to be a very different show than a couple months before the first show out when they're touring their new record you never even know. if it's entered even if it's an energetic poppy you know artist that makes you want to dance all the time yeah that's still going to show itself you never know what goes on so it's hard to say i think that all varies it's hit or miss it's mostly hit but again whether it's the first show of the tour or the last show of the tour or dead in the middle it's hard to say what's going to be the best show in the world i mean you don't know you know you, you can't say the first show is going to be better than the last show right. because 
they're excited or the last show is better than the first show because they got all the technicals arranged. Right. You never know. Right. It always varies. Right, right. So you've had a lot of interactions with artists, you know, on a, on a professional level, helping to put, get, put together their shows. You know, how do, how, do you, how do you see the relationship or how, even better, how would you describe the relationship between an engineer and an artist? The relationship between an engineer and an artist is interesting. For the artist to portray what they want to portray and get their message across, how they want to get it across, requires an engineer that is good at his job, first of all. But it also requires the artist to trust that engineer. That's why you'll see some artists that are on the road and they've had the same engineer for decades. You know, there are artists that do that. That's not uncommon. No. Um, There are obviously some bad relationships between artists and engineers and ultimately the artist is your boss right you have to listen to the artist you have to make their world as comfortable as possible on the stage so they don't have to think about anything else but what they're actually doing and playing if an artist is on stage and there's feedback everywhere which is the loud ringing noise you hear when a mic is turned up too loud or not EQ'd correctly, or a monitor, what the musician is hearing is not EQ'd correctly. If there's feedback going wild on stage, you know, an artist isn't going to be able to concentrate on the song he's trying to play for you. And if you think about it, that's that artist's job is to play a song that they wrote or had written for them with as much feeling and and as meaningful as the first time they played it. So they don't want to have to think about anything else but what they're doing. So the relationship, it all depends. It's, it's, it's a trust relationship. The artist has to trust you. Um, and the engineer ultimately has to be good at his job. Then the relationship is okay. Right. Well, it sounds like it's like a pretty common workplace environment just in a very unnatural setting. Yeah. In, a, in the middle of a rock venue. But there's a lot of trust that has to be built between an engineer and an artist both of them need to have that inherent trust alone that you're going to make things work the way that yeah. you want it and in any business world to any you know in any industry it a lot of it comes down to i mean it comes down to skill but with anything else it comes down to personalities if your personalities just don't mesh it might not be a good fit for instance if you're at work and you have a coworker and it's just someone that you do not get along with, it's not going to be a fun day at work when you have to work with them. Right. If you go to work and you have a boss that respects you and allows you to do your job and do it well and how you know how to do it, you're going to feel good about going to work and, and, and you're going to be a great employee to that, bo- to that boss. It's the same with musicians. It's like if your personality is okay and you get along, it goes a long way to making those skills that you know how to do sound and look even better right and that would make sense why some artists keep engineers for decades on hand because that trust is just built in there absolutely when artists come in here you know i would say probably 85 percent of the time i'll be mixing their shows and the other 15 percent they'll bring along their own engineer even if it's just for the engineer to be here to assist in what i'm doing um, that automatically makes the artist feel more comfortable. Sometimes they'll mix too, and then I'll assist that engineer on the room and its quirks. I'm here, if they bring an engineer, I am here to make their world as efficient and their time here is as, as, as good as possible. There's, an, there's a saying in the audio world, like, who's your second favorite engineer? Because typically, you know, you're your own favorite. <laughs> so there's egos involved too. Yeah. Here, when yeah. you come here, I don't care about that. I'm here to make your life as comfortable and easy as possible while you're here because that only goes a long way. And there are people that leave here that I've seen after the fact, whether it be backstage at Lollapalooza or artists alike, that will remember me because yeah. of that. Yeah. Well, and it, it, it really does develop an intimate relationship between you and the staff of the artists. Now, as you mentioned with artists, a lot of them have very different personalities and a lot of times what you see on stage isn't exactly who they are once they get off stage. Sometimes it's exactly the same. Uh, when you are working with an artist, you know how, how common is it to see that separation between onstage persona and offstage persona? You know, I think that when anybody walks in this room with no crowd in it, um, they don't have to be on. They're not going to be on. They're a normal person, right? I don't treat anybody that comes in this room any different than my coworkers. Every everyone to me, I don't I don't treat them 
as a star or I just saw them on Jimmy Kimmel last week. I don't I don't see that. It's just they're normal people doing their job. So so most artists come in and again, they walk through the door. We say, hey, here's coffee, here's water. And they're they're just normal people sitting on a chair. Uh, they're not on. But once the lights hit and there's a crowd involved and they know they have to deliver to that crowd or to this radio station or to the on air listeners a product, they turn it on and they're exactly who you see on stage. They are they are professional entertainers and that's how most of them act once the lights turn on. Yeah, but that's not a bad thing, though, because that's what you're expecting out of them. You're there to be entertained, and that's what they are incredibly talented at as well. So I don't mean it in a negative sense, as in, oh, is their persona, they're such a jerk off the stage, but everyone loves them on the stage. But you really do have to play up that showmanship. Yeah, I mean, th- you know, if, you, if you're always on, you know, it's exhausting. Yeah, you're bur- you get burnt out. So, you know, they come in here, and they're just – walking through like a normal human being and once they got on stage they do their job you know they're, they're entertainers they turn it on and off and you exactly you know some people are on all the time so most aren't right that's just also who they are yes it's the type of personality Correct. they exude I mean, some comedians are just on non-stop you yeah. understand how they can survive yeah so when you are back there either going through sound check or even during a show while you're mixing you know do you ever find yourself just getting lost in the performance like concert goers do? I never get lost in the show per se. Um, you have to constantly be watching because of the scenario. From this room, sometimes we go live to the air. We always go live to video. We're always live in the room. So to get lost in the show, you would immediately not be, do be doing your job. But I will tell you, there are times where I'm mixing a show and for about two seconds, I look up and I see Chris Cornell and how cool it is that I'm mixing Black Hole Sun in front of 85 people with a cellist accompanying him. I mean, that was like stunning. And for two seconds, I'm like, wow, this is pretty amazing. And then immediately back down to reality. Okay, let's make sure this thing, (laughs) you know, we don't screw this thing up. Yeah. Well, that's got to be that's got to be one of the biggest challenges that comes with it, because you have critically acclaimed artists and like you said when they walk in you treat everyone as human but still once they are on stage doing what they do I mean these people are the top one percent in their field as far as the talent they have their ability to create something beautiful and I just find it amazing that that doesn't happen more often you know again for a couple seconds maybe you 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 think about it and you hear a song that you really really enjoy um or you have someone like, she didn't play any music, but Mavis Staples is sitting on stage. And I'm a huge soul lover, so you see someone like that, and you're like, man, you know, you're in front of greatness. So you can get lost in music a little bit, but literally for two seconds, and then you're just trying to make sure the thing goes off without a hitch. And that's when all the feedback comes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, when you get fired. Yeah, so like you said, we have had legends like Mavis Staples here, but we've also seen a ton of incredible emerging artists. And as a soul fan, I know someone that you'll dig is Leon Bridges. We had him in here at the very onset of his career. I think one of the very first performances he ever gave, he was in this room. And now he's coming back later on in September to headline the Aragon Ballroom. So from your perspective, you know, what's it like to see an artist grow like that coming in very early on in their career where they're playing venues that are as big as the stage here and coming back, you know, how do they grow professionally? Personally, do you see any change in their approach um, or do you see consistency that comes with it? Well, first of all, it's really cool to see an artist. And when Leon Bridges came in, for instance, um, I was familiar with one of his songs. His record hadn't been released. The record rep, Amy Kaplan, had said, I'm bringing somebody in in a couple weeks. Check him out. I think you really like him. I listened and I couldn't wait. He comes in. Again, I'm the engineer. No engineer comes with him. He's got one song out, uh, plays four or five tunes. The room wasn't even that full, and it was amazing. I was a fan immediately. He leaves, and in the coming months, he's on a big-time slot commercial on the Grammys for Squarespace. I don't know if you remember that commercial. Yeah. And all of a sudden, his record is taken off, and he is now – a star. I mean, the guy is headlining Aragon Ballroom, which is what, 4,000 people at yeah. least. So in that respect, it's really, really cool. Um, 
and and with artists like that, I'll always listen to a record or or what I can prior to them coming in. We usually get a, a note ahead of we, we know ahead of time a couple weeks when an artist is coming in. So I'll listen to their record. I'll look at a lot of the artists backing band, you know, from early on to 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 now when they're playing on the Grammy stage or when they're big and and you see consistency sometimes, but sometimes you see all new bands. It depends on the artist, you know. Some artists are the front men and then they have all hired hands behind them. So yeah, I mean you you so as you mentioned, artists will evolve personally, professionally, in terms of their stage show, who they're bringing up on stage when they return after first debuting three years ago. Do you notice when you're setting up for a show, those changes in an artist, do they feel more comfortable? Is there more of a routine for them? Or do they still kind of take the same approach as when they first started? When artists do return, I feel like they are more comfortable. Of course, depending on where they're at initially in their career. When they first come, you know, um, we had an artist with a couple massive songs now, Alice Merton, come in. And she was came in super humble, very, very green. So she was great. She was amazing. She, she killed it, and she was extremely, extremely nice. Um, the next time she comes in, she'll probably be a bit more comfortable. She's going to be the same amazing person, but I will guarantee you she'll be a lot more comfortable with her situation as she's played – in other venues, uh, in bigger crowds. She's done a lot more radio stuff. She's going to be more comfortable. So, yeah, you do see the comfort level of an artist um, grow when they come back after they've had a lot more experience, if they came here at the very beginning of their career. Right. Well, and I remember with Alice Merton's case, this was her very first stop in Chicago ever. She hadn't played any other venues anywhere else in Chicago before she came here, but she, as you mentioned, delivered an incredible performance. And it just has to be that familiarity factor with life as a musician. And, you know, for younger musicians, you have the aspirations to be able to get to that level. But seemingly until you go through it, it's hard to really understand and let your guard down, per se, and become comfortable with doing this type of thing. So we've, we've talked a lot about the room, talked about the technical aspects, talk about what it's like for an artist putting together a show and talked about that on a macro level too for different stages now i want to ask you a couple things that i know are on people's minds every single time you go to a show this isn't going to be a segment but it's going to be a segment we're going to call it we're going to call it ask the engineer and i want you to either defy or confirm some stereotypes that i ask okay you. i will do All my right? best so we have uh, some common concert quips and i want those explained from the engineer perspective <laughs> Now, this is, again, from one engineer's perspective. It could right. be different. Let's say you aren't going to speak for all engineers' perspective. This is just purely in your experience. How often is it the sound person's fault that an artist doesn't sound good? I would say that depends. The artist is sick or they're just not playing well. It could be the artist's fault. depends on if it's the playing you know, or you know, the engineer. If it's the mix sounds bad. If what you're seeing and what you normally get from that artist is not what you're getting, that can be an engineer's fault. Maybe the PA went sideways and a subwoofer's out on one side. So you're not getting the low end you want. Could be equipment failure. So it's not always the engineer's fault. Um, it's not always the artist's fault. I think the blame can be thrown around depending on the day. It's a very politically correct answer. <laughs> so when when an artist does play on a tour, they're playing similar sized rooms across the country. Uh, you know, internationally, if they tour, they could be playing similar size venues. But how, how much does a room play into the way an artist sounds compared to how you're hearing them on the record? The, the room can make all the difference. As you know, you and I and everybody listening has their favorite venues, probably because they've seen either their favorite artist or they've seen the best show they've seen there. You're going to get a much different feeling at a show if you're watching it at a festival like Lollapalooza or at their headlining show at the Aragon. The technicals of a show, the technical aspects of a show will change if it's the artist's own headlining tour or they're the support act in an outdoor venue, you know, or they're playing in this room. Even the way they feel will change. Right. You know, if you're a support act playing in during the day at Lollapalooza, 
the feeling of your show just inevitably is going to change than if you're headlining somewhere like the Concord. You know, you're going to, the room definitely plays a role, I think, in how a show feels or sounds. Well, can you tell that, can you tell that from the onset, you have everything mic'd up the way you want it, the way that the artist wants it. You have the sound and the technical aspects down, but once the show gets started, how quick do you realize that this is different than what we may have planned? Well, I don't think it's a good or a bad thing. My previous comments, you know, seeing an act during the day as a support and discovering that act may be really, really kind of cool. And you're, you're outdoors, you're at a cool venue. And I just use that example because a lot of times, you know, I prefer to see a, an artist during their headlining set on their own tour in maybe even a smaller venue, say subterranean, as opposed to noon at Lollapalooza. Right. Um, but at the onset, you know how a festival feels. If you're an engineer, you know how a festival feels, an outdoor venue feels. You know how House of Blues is going to feel. Um, you know, you, you know kind of as an engineer what, what the, you know, if it's a room you've never been in before, it's going to be different. But, you know, you kind of get the vibe of the room. Same with, with people going to a show. If you're going to go to a Lollapalooza after party and Arcade Fire is playing the Metro, I'm willing to bet that that show is a lot higher energy just because it's at the Metro than their headlining set at Lollapalooza. Right. Just because it's a thousand people packed into a room and it's a headliner playing that small venue, you know, on one night. I think that the room will definitely play a role and you will know, you know, you go to the Metro to see a band because you like the Metro, not just because you like the band, but you also like the Metro. Right. That's why, you know, Park West, is a common favorite of of XRT listeners. I know that. You know, you see some great shows at Park West. The sound, you know, to me at Park West is great. The the vibe is great. The the layout, it's it's a really cool venue. Yeah, so location provides a physical and a mental way of contributing to the show and Hands the progression down. of a show. Hands down. I mean, you I know you have seen the Foo Fighters at the Metro. Yes. You've seen the Foo Fighters at larger venues. Yes. Correct? Yes. When you went to the Metro, and I'm going to turn this around, and you saw the Foo Fighters at the Metro, that, knowing that, your, your experience going into it already changed. Yeah. You're going you, to see the Foo Fighters at the Metro. You're you headlined. You already know that it's going to be special, that it's a unique experience, that is something that doesn't come around every single tour. I know when they did Sonic Highways, they played across the street at Cubby Bear, but even then, that was a rare experience because which most is of the time- also sorry, sorry to cut you off, but it's also different than seeing them at the Metro. Right. You walk in the Cubby Bear and you see Foo Fighters. The world has changed. You know, it's much different than even seeing them at the Metro, and Wrigley Field is much different than the Met. You know, it's it's yeah. it all varies. Well, the next logical step is to get them in the Blue Cross Blue Shield performance That's stage. That's what I'm talking about. I don't know how much smaller they can get after that, outside of coming and doing a cubicle show. Yeah. You know. <laughs> So I'm into that. that's a that, you know it's a really it's a really interesting point that I think people may overlook as it goes into a show that the room really does affect everyone involved from the fans, the engineers, the artists. For that exact reason, the circumstances of the show are different from city to city to city. So when you do get a band, let's say like the Foo Fighters, who has a lot of gear up on stage, how many of those amps are actually on, and how many are just there for show? Well, that depends. I'm going to take you back to when I was a huge metalhead, and my favorite metal band was a band called Lamb of God. And they are a loud, you know, a kick-ass band. When I would go to their shows and I would crowd surf, I'm 6'4", and I would crowd surf, um, they had a wall of amps. The whole back of the stage was covered with, I think, Mesa Boogie stacks from the bass to the guitars. And those are big amplifiers. Massive. Look like look like rock and roll amplifiers. Yes. And they were stacked up, I think three levels high, literally the width of the stage. And when I was a teenager, I thought every one of those amps was on. <laughs> and I was like, man, I need to get all those amps. You know, I wanted all those amps. Anyway, only one of those amps was on. <laughs> you know, all the rest were for show and they were shells, and that's just a set. So it depends on the set. You know, you'll have Buddy Guy playing at 
Chicago theater out of a, I don't know what it uses, but say it's a Fender Deluxe, one small amp, you know, one by 12. Um, and that one amp is on, it's filling the room. So it's hard to say. I mean, everyone needs one amp. Sometimes they do a cool stereo thing where they have both amps on different kind of amps. And they'll make it stereo. Uh, that all depends. Right. I mean, you don't need a wall of amps to fill a venue. But it looks cool. It looks really cool. So in that case, I don't know if you saw this, are, were those actual amps that were up on stage, or did they have one stack of actual amps and the rest were cardboard with pictures glued onto it? From the Lamb of God show? Yeah. Well, after doing some investigating on their live uh, videos that I always watched, um, it was one amp, and it was all actual cabinets Wood cabinets, I believe. And the cabinet's just like the shell of an amp. The shell right? of an amp with no speakers inside. So it was a lot lighter, and it was all for show. So the crew can put it up and take it down. It was part of the backdrop of the show. Gotcha. But those things looked mean when they came out, and they got look, everybody it, pumped up. Everything is more metal with more amps up there, even <laughs> if only one of them is actually plugged in and working. Now that, now that we've defied that conception that all the amps on the stage, A, are actually amps, B, are actually turned on, what, what's the most annoying instrument for you to mic and to get correct so that the audience can hear it nice and clear or that the artist can hear it as they intended for you to hear it? You know, there's multiple things going on during a show. And to give you an example, there's the front of house mix, which is the mix the crowd hears. And then there are, there are the monitor mixes that all the musicians hear. So as far as annoying... I think a banjo is annoying to mix for the artist in a wedge, a speaker on the ground coming back. That's at what's them. in the front of the stage. Correct. It's at the, usually the feet of the artist. Right. It's facing them so they can hear themselves. Because banjos, they can run a little bit They, as far as feedback. Uh, they're just kind of annoying to me. They're not impossible by any means. They're just annoying. Um, I've never mic'd an acoustic piano live done it in studios never live so i think i can imagine that one will be pretty annoying although fun and a challenge it'll just be a little annoying but i don't know i think a banjo is annoying you know i'm trying to think so there's not really one set instrument that when an engineer receives the email that the band is going to be using this equipment that you look at and go oh really i got to do that no i don't think so i think i think again it largely depends on the situation okay but when there's a lot of open mics on a stage, especially in this room, it becomes anything becomes a challenge, especially condenser microphones because they're more sensitive than regular vocal microphones. Right. And how, how does a condenser microphone work for those that may be unaware? Well, with a condenser microphone, you need to power it from somewhere. So from the console, for instance, the mic's pickup pattern is a lot more sensitive which means it can get back into the audio system and feed back. So when you have a lot of those on stage, you just have to be very careful to EQ feedback out and certain frequencies out so you don't hear that loud squealing right. like you do when there's a poor engineer on, on, in front of house. <laughs> yeah, I always pass the blame off to someone else, I see. So it, it, those, those are very sensitive, but I'm glad to hear that there's that an artist can – basically have free reign of instruments at their disposal that's not going to be universally despised by engineers. Well, and some some instruments affect engineers in different ways. You know, some may hate certain instruments. You know, here at least, it always feels like a challenge, and I don't necessarily have to tour with it every day either. So it comes in here one day, and I'll have fun with it because, you know, I get to see it, and I get to mic it, and I get to mix it when normally I wouldn't. So, you know... I don't really hate anything. I don't think that's come in. I can't really think of something that I really despise, but other engineers' opinions can differ on that. What kind of instruments have you had come in here that you don't normally see or that you do get that unique experience from? You know, ba uh, uh, cello. Cello is not very common. Um, we've had upright basses, which are also fun. I love the sound of an upright bass, um, which are much different than electric basses clearly, because they're acoustic instruments. They're not amplified. Um, banjo, mandolin occasionally. You know, you get some of those kind of instruments. I don't think uh, – we actually had a melodica. What's a melodica? It's a keyboard that the musician attaches to their hand or holds in their hand, 
plays keys with their other hand that's on it. It's very small. It's probably about the size of a foot-long Subway sandwich. They are not the sponsor. <laughs> and it has keys, like a keyboard on it. It also has a hole that you blow in. And when you blow, you play the keys, and it's got a funky sound. I remember that. Rhiannon Giddens yes. had it. Rhiannon Giddens. See, I always thought that was just a jazzed-up kazoo. No. It wasn't a jazzed up kazoo, although kazoos are pretty fun too. <laughs> I didn't think that'd be an instrument you actually have to mic, but here we are. So, actually, before you go there, I went and saw a New Orleans like jazz. Lynn Bramer gave me the tickets. New Orleans like jazz like big band at Chicago Theater. I'm sitting dead center. I'm looking at the band, and uh, the guy pulls out a kazoo, <laughs> and he starts playing the kazoo. It was unbelievable. And my roommate, my best friend, sitting next to me. And he goes, dude. And he opens up his jacket. And he's got a kazoo in his jacket. <laughs> and I was like, Joe, you got to call and response right now. This is your time to shine. <laughs> like This guy, nobody pulls out a kazoo at a concert. Yeah. And Joe's got one in his pocket. Like, I'm like, Joe, you know, we're dead center. Lynn Bramer had great tickets. We're dead center right at the balcony. So we were like front row. And I'm like, dude, this would it would look like a setup. That's how ridiculous it was. But anyway, okay, go ahead. All those years of going to shows and bringing kazoo, you've never had the chance <laughs> yeah, until this one. I I'm glad he was he finally rewarded. I could not believe he had a kazoo. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing with a kazoo? And it was wild. The other guy was playing. It was so funny. It works. It yeah. works. So, Dom, I want to thank you again for joining me today and uh, just give, giving everyone the lowdown on, you know, how engineering works, how a lot of the backside of – putting a live show together works and all the intricacies that all of the intricacies that do go into it. So before I let you go, I need to find out what's the one thing that you should never say to a sound engineer. If you're a fan or if you're a musician, both. All right. Well, if you're a fan, just don't ask me to put more bass in the mix because there's a reason, you know, you're hearing what you're hearing. So easy with the bass. <laughs> If you're an artist, there's nothing really you can't ask for, especially if you're on this level, but everybody wants more of them. Everybody wants to hear more of themselves. Each musician on the stage, no matter who it is. Correct. Can, you, can I hear more of me? Can you turn me up? <laughs> what do you do in that case? Turn them up. <laughs> That's what I do. I turn them up. <laughs> That's what they want. But it's all, it's constant. It's like, yeah. you know, or... Can you make it sound less tinny? I don't know. It's hard. That's hard. That's a hard question. Yeah, well, that's, you know, there's no there's no universal answer to it. I'm sure if you ask an engineer from another venue, they'd have something else. But they don't tell me I'm wrong. There you go. So the moral of the story for all this is that everyone's different. There's no set way to put a show together. And no matter how many times you ask, there's enough bass in the mix. Well, <laughs> I guess it depends on the artist. Okay, that's fair. So, Dom, I want to thank you again for joining us today on Inside the Archives podcast and letting me pick your brain about how a concert gets put together and logistics behind it. So if you haven't visited the Blue Cross Blue Shield performance stage here at XRT or have visited and are coming again in the future, just be sure to uh, poke your head behind the console, give Dom a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you want more bass in the mix. But then again, you'll be labeled as one of those people that he was talking about earlier. But that's, you know, your own decision. We'll let you do what you'd like. But... He does a fantastic job here making sure everything sounds great on all ends of the spectrum for artists, for fans, for those people listening on the radio, or for those people watching on the webcast. So, Dom, thanks again for joining us. Absolutely. You know, after hearing that great kazoo story, I just had to put in a kazoo sound bumper as we transition into the news segment. So thanks again to Dom for jumping on and giving us a scoop on how live music gets put together. Speaking of live music, we have a lot of news in that area to cover, starting off with Jack White's recent performance on Saturday Night Live. White took the SNL stage to perform the Boarding House Reach songs Connected by Love and Over and Over and Over. As White gets set to kick off his tour, I was wondering how these songs would translate to the live setting. They kicked ass and had ripping guitar solos do it as well. So I think any fans that are going to see him this summer will definitely be in for a treat. Another treat for rock fans are Foo Fighters guitarist Chris Shiflett's latest comments. In an interview he did with Rolling Stone, Shiflett revealed that the band's set list this summer will quote-unquote change on a dime. 
The band wants to keep fans on their toes and will be changing up the set list every night. They'll rearrange the order of songs, cut songs, add songs, and add in different variations. So if you're going to go check out the Foo Fighters at Wrigley Field on July 29th or 30th, you're going to expect to see some awesome shows. Before we wrap things up, I have to touch on one of my favorite days of the year, Record Store Day. It's happening this Saturday, and earlier on this week, I put up a guide on 93XRT.com about everything you need to know for the day. Uh, We cover a few record shops around the Chicagoland area you want to check out, a video on how to properly clean your vinyl records, as well as a podcast I recently recorded with Ryan Arnold about Record Store Day, where we chat about the meaning of Record Store Day, all the cool features it has, and why you'll want to get up, get out of your house, and get to your local independent record store this coming Saturday. And I also included what we're doing here on XRT, which I am psyched about, because once again, we'll be having an all-vinyl Saturday happening this Saturday from noon until midnight. Marty Leonard's Frankie Lee, and Bill Artlip will be spinning album sides on vinyl to celebrate Record Store Day. It's a great programming feature that accompanies a great day, and I hope you'll join me in turning your radios up to 11 as we provide the soundtrack for Record Store Day. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks again to Dom Mendocino for joining us, and thank you for listening to Inside the Archives podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe, leave us a review, and share it with your friends. For 93XRT and Inside the Archives, I'm Marty Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum.